Sometime in the late 11th century, the Buddhist Burmese king Kyanzit of Bagan made a rather audacious claim to his vassals. He said that he wrote a letter in vermilion ink on gold leaf proclaiming the grace of the three jewels of Buddhism and sent it off to a South Indian king called the Choli Prince. Now, this prince, according to Kyanzita, then immediately cast off his adherence to fake doctrines and adhered straight away to the true doctrine, Buddhism, and even sent his daughter to marry Kyanzita. Now, did this ever really happen? <laughs> Probably not. But as always, it will reveal to us a past world that was a lot like ours. I'm Anirudh Ganesetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. So, if you've been watching Thinking Medieval for a while, you might have noticed that the world of the medieval Indian Ocean has a lot of parallels to today's. It had a domineering Chinese presence, it had innovative cultural diplomacy, and it had international commercial organizations. We can learn a lot about the deep dynamics that govern how nations and rulers work by looking at these cosmopolitan medieval peoples. So let's go back to the Buddhist Burmese prince and the Indian ruler he's supposed to have converted to Buddhism, the Choli prince. Now the Choli prince was probably none other than the mighty Chora emperor, Kulotunga I, whom we know from temple inscriptions was a major patron of Shaivism, Vaishnavism, and Shaktism. Now, a guy like that isn't going to convert to Buddhism because some distant Burmese king, even a prospective son-in-law, sent him a letter. So, why did Kyanzita make such a boast? Studies of Chola inscriptions reveal the answer. In 1090, Kulotunga I had renewed an endowment made by his grandfather to a Buddhist monastery in the great Tamil port of Nagapattinam. This monastery had been built there in 1016 by yet another Southeast Asian power, Srivijaya, a naval confederacy based in Indonesia who controlled trade routes from India to China. Srivijaya had funded the monastery as a sign of friendly commercial ties with the Chola kingdom. Though in this video, we explored why that kind of failed. The answer is because in 1025, Kurotanga's grandfather got very ambitious and sacked a bunch of Srivijayan cities. Oops. So, when Kulotanga finally renewed the endowment decades later, he was trying to declare institutionally through a sort of religious and cultural diplomacy that he'd managed to restore friendly commerce again. Around the same time, Kulotanga also sought to cultivate diplomatic and marital ties with Bagan, which was a rising Burmese kingdom and an important stopping point for Tamil shipping. So he definitely must have exchanged letters with Kyanzita, its ruler, and Kyanzita, like all politicians do, spun it to make himself look more powerful in the eyes of his domestic political audience. But Kulotunga's grand strategy worked. About a hundred years later, Chinese texts recorded that Bagan and the Chola kingdom were closely connected and easy to travel between. But that isn't all. Though Kulotanga isn't as well known as his grandfather Rajendra Chora, he's arguably even more interesting because of how much he knew of and tried to engage with his world. In 1079, he gave an endowment of 600,000 gold pieces to a Taoist monastery in Guangzhou, which impressed the Chinese court. So much so that they granted him the title of the great general who supports obedience and cherishes renovations. The Chola Empire was also granted first-class trading status by the Chinese, which may have been Kulotunga's real goal. But to me, the really mind-blowing thing is that Kulotunga wasn't actually unique in doing any of this. It seems that most medieval Indian Ocean courts did something of this sort, and there's evidence that Lanka, Java, and Cambodia also built and renovated temples in different places and exchanged religious relics and scriptures as a means of strengthening commerce. This unique form of cultural and religious diplomacy would later be extinguished by colonial rule. Royal diplomacy helped structure and smooth international trade in the medieval Indian Ocean world, but far more significant and pervasive exchanges were conducted by merchants. Indian, especially Tamil merchants, are among the unsung heroes of global economic history. One particular guild, known as the Ainu River or the 500, was perhaps the most influential commercial organization in Asian history 
trading in everything from horses to spices to ivory, textiles and bronze. They are attested in historical materials across nearly 900 years, originating in the Deccan in the 8th century and spreading through much of the southwestern and eastern Indian coastline by the 11th century before fading away by the 17th. Medieval merchants used both war and diplomacy to achieve their commercial objectives. A 1015 embassy from the Chola court to China presented 21,000 ounces of pearls. The ambassadors, who were themselves merchants, also separately presented 6,600 ounces of pearls and 3,300 catties of drugs that they themselves had purchased. In return, they received several court honours and participated in the emperor's birthday festivities. We mentioned that the Chola Emperor Kolotunga's grandfather reigned Sri Vijay in 1025, and here's another potential reason why. It could have been funded by Tamil merchant guilds who wanted to punish the Sri Vijaya confederacy for competing with them in Chinese markets and to open up opportunities for themselves. Thereafter, Tamil merchants settled across Southeast Asia and China, often forming influential intergenerational diasporas. In her PhD thesis, Dr. Risha Lee showed that in the late 14th century, Tamil merchants even constructed a Shiva temple in the port of Kwanjao, which was unfortunately destroyed by ethnic rebellions soon after. This was the easternmost Hindu temple in history, until the 20th century saw a new wave of Indian diasporas spreading across the world. The history of the Indian Ocean is one of extraordinary drama, full of violence and cultural innovation, greed and loss. What repeatedly emerges over time is that its peoples had a sophisticated understanding of each other's courts, cultures, and religions. They developed long-term commercial strategies spanning thousands of kilometers, all of which unfolded through diplomacy and gift-giving. These medieval peoples have much to teach us about creating respectful, deeply involved trading policies in the 21st century, as well as the possible dangers of mercantile, military, and political power coming together. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories, and on Twitter at Akanisati. We'll see you next week.